So, so can you tell me a little bit about yourself, your name, where you live and where you work? Uh, my name is Sherry Fisher. I live in Medfield, Massachusetts, which is uh, in suburban Boston. And my office is in my house, so that's where I work, actually, in the little bitty town of Medfield. Um, I am a, a learning specialist by training and background. Uh, I work with kids and families in schools. So um, within that, there are a number of different things that I actually do. So one of the things that I do is I provide direct service for kids who are not performing well in school for any of a number of different reasons. It might be because they are uh, having trouble in a certain content area. It is usually because there are lots of other more complex things going on. It's not just that they need to learn how to you know, do long division. It usually is something else. And they've not long since lost motivation for going to school. And, or maybe they're having social problems or they're having difficulty with their parents or they don't finish their homework, or they forget things, or they have attention problems, or that, you know, there's yeah. loads of different things there. With, uh, I work with their parents, often in a separate uh, coaching um, relationship, because the parents have also started to give up, and they start to look at what's wrong with their child, and then that's reinforced by what they hear from the school, and the teachers find that all the things that are wrong with the, the student, because they're not measuring up to whatever standards need to happen. So I work with the teachers to help them look at what's good about the student, and also about what they're doing in their classroom so the teachers come to find out what they are doing well and, and shift the focus to what is working as opposed to what they're trying to fix. And of course, things get better. All those things that you want to fix um, can be addressed much more positively if you're looking at what's already working. Yeah. Um, and then I also provide workshops to schools that are completely independent of um, working with uh, a specific family and that school. And um, I'm published with two of my um, Master in Applied Positive Psychology colleagues from the first class that we graduated in. Um, this is my book here. Oh, can you show me? It's called Smart Strengths. All right, all right. And it, it applies positive psychology for exactly the kinds of uh, people who um, I work with. So people, um, you know, students and parents and teachers, and also as the dimension of athletic coaches because um, many kids uh, participate in youth sports. Right, right. And, and what's, what's your training background? Can you say something? I'm a learning specialist in training. So I have uh, an undergraduate degree in English and history and psychology. Uh, and I have a master's degree in education. And then um, professionally, when I finished my master's degree, I went to work in a private school for um, boys, a boarding school for boys who had been diagnosed with dyslexia. All of them had been school failures wherever they were and their uh, families had given up on public school so some of the kids were as young as fourth or fifth or sixth grade uh, some of them were coming for a postgraduate year after um, high school where they had sort of limped through school but I learned uh, something that I had never learned before and that is that there were students in the world who were not like me I did high school in three years I went on to college and you know, school was very easy for me and I suddenly was faced with trying to help people learn how to read. I, I don't ever remember learning how to read. I've read my whole life. I never remember having to learn how to write or do any of those things and I was faced with teaching kids who couldn't do that. And I was fascinated at what was really good about them. Yeah. And it was a strengths-based program. This was almost 30 years ago when I started working there and it was a strengths-based program then when we did not have a positive psychology. and. The rest of my professional career has basically been spent working with kids who are otherwise very capable in ways that school does not value or yeah. does not measure or does not include as part of the package of the whole child. Right, 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 right. So that's what I do. What about coaching? What's your background in coaching? So my background as a coach, I would, would like to say that I've pretty much been doing it my whole professional career. Uh, there wasn't a name for it. We didn't call it that. A coach was somebody who helped you learn how to swing a tennis racket or kick a soccer ball. And that certainly was not what I was doing. But I would like to, to think that I've always done this. When I got to University of Pennsylvania and I actually took a positive psychology coaching class with Karen Rybich, uh, I got an A+. Plus. She was amazed at what I knew and what I could do already and I instantly had applications and adaptations and I, I did great at that because I'm not only am I probably kind of a natural at it, it's my own way of the way I view the world and the, the clients and students and families that I work with. I think it just is a real fit for what people need. Yeah. So it was very easy for me. I, I could have taken, you know, class after class after class. I could have taught all those people who I was sitting with um, when I would, would uh, 
go and work and do partner exercises. Uh, I was the teacher and you know the person I was with. <laughs> yeah. I when it was time to do the um, and my, my person I worked with, my, my, my trial client, my guinea pig, my guinea pig person said their life was transformed by this. Somebody who'd known me, and actually she's a very dear friend of mine, she'd known me her whole life, she said, I had no idea you knew how to do this. <laughs> right. So, right. It's great. And, and, so, uh, and how much would you say today that coaching is part of your job? Every day. It, I, I couldn't not do it, I don't think. It's very, it's just very integral to the way that I work with people. Right, right. Is that individuals or groups or both? Um, both. Um, when I work with students, most of the time it's individual because they're, they, they don't really want to share their struggles and their pain with a fellow student because especially if you get someone who's in middle school, they're really sensitive about what they think other people think about them already. Yeah. And um, in order to be able to make quicker progress, especially if you're trying to do a combination of academic work as well as the, um, the positive coaching work, you really, I find anyway, I could, I could have them be in a group and, and have them see that they have, you know, other people share their pain, but there's kind of something about being an adolescent where you feel like you're the only person in the whole world who's yeah. ever felt the way that you feel, yeah. and having an adult who says, yeah, that must really be tough. I, you know, what can we do about that? Have you got any ideas? And then to be able to take their ideas, integrate that into something. They have no idea what you're going to do, mm -hmm. um, but then suddenly they feel like there's something good about themselves. and. Um, eventually, you can see them in group settings, but yeah. um, I don't usually start there. Right, right, right. And and so the people that you typically coach is, are the young ones and the teachers and who, who, who? And the parents. And the parents. Yes. And and so what issues do they ask you to help them uh, address? Well, uh, the parents are exhausted. They hate homework. They want to know what could possibly be done to improve things. They are really worried about what's going to happen to their child. You know, um, will my kid ever get into college? Um, they're also really almost embarrassed that they're not better parents because, of course, if they were good parents, they wouldn't be having these problems and they wouldn't have to come see me in the first place. Um, and but parents refer um, other parents to me, so. Once they come to see me, they're really very relieved because now they found out they're not the only one. They finally they connected in the community with, with another parent. So it's good for parents to sometimes uh, participate in workshops together. Um, although a lot of their personal information they like to have be um, you know private in in my office as opposed to what you can do when you're um, you know in a a small group or you're paired up during uh, a time where you get to practice an exercise. Yeah. But the um, the parents uh, usually it's mothers because the dads are. You know, leaving that in the hands of mom, and most of the time, the um, the moms are just overwhelmed and they're exhausted. And the husband comes home, and the husband wants to you know, like unload about how horrible his day has been, and thinks that mom's had it easy all day because all she did, had to do was like hang around the house if she's a stay-at-home mom, or maybe she has her part-time job. And these moms are completely overwhelmed at trying to manage their kids, right. and and the fathers are either um, exasperated with the women. So a lot of times these are, are um, problems that are happening in addition to what the presenting problem is that you know my kids having trouble in math. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And, but they don't really need therapy per se. You know, they're not so they're not at a point where I could say, oh gee, you know, if you considered couples therapy or whatever, mm -hmm. however I might say that, they're usually not there. What they really need is they need to, to feel like together they are looking at this child that they brought into the world and seeing something really valuable and good. Yeah, yeah. And then that really turns things around. Right. And so how do you work with them? What, what does it normally look like? To work with like uh, any client? Yeah, coaching engagement in general, what does that look A coaching like? engagement in general, uh, for students it could be anywhere from seeing somebody for, um, usually for a semester, because it, or it, you know, it might be for a term which would be like eight weeks or so in school, um, or 12 weeks if they're on a trimester system. But uh, chances are I see them for a semester at a time, because it's good to see them through their learning, their coaching tools at the same time as they're also learning academic skills that are tied to goal setting. Right. So the, the, um, the tools of positive psychology um, that are outside of goal setting support making sure that they're making progress. At the same time, it, does, it is incremental growth that they're, they're having and as more things get piled on them in terms of assignments and, and content, they really have to learn to be more resilient so they're not going to you know, come and see me once and we're going to have everything you know, all happy and fixed. Instead, they have to learn how they're going to work without me. Right. So 
Uh, but I also I do have people who have come and stayed with me you know, if, if they have some fairly significant ongoing processing problem or they are um, very um, executive function disordered and, and each time they get a new challenge it asks them to do things in new ways and they really need somebody to guide them. In that case it's not just uh, doing positive psychology coaching, in that case I'm integrating my uh, education domain experience with the tools of coaching that make it possible to keep them moving on and not right. to, be, to become discouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so what, what would it look like? Like, what, what happens before you meet them the first time? Well, um, usually people will either contact me through my website or they'll call me or email me. They, you know, they'll have some contact information. Um, I have my initial um, meeting with them on the phone. So that would be the parents? That would be the parents, yes. Yeah. Uh, initial meeting over the phone. I um, get them to tell me what it is that they are hoping, um, as opposed to having them tell me what they think is wrong and having me give them some sort of diagnostic information on the phone. Uh, I might say, gee, it sounds like such and such, and get them to tell me more, or can you tell me more about that? Yeah. Um, my favorite story, I told this one uh, to, to uh, Marty Seligman this weekend when he told me that resilience is not sexy. I said, Marty, resilience is sexy. I had a woman call me, and, and she said, I am, I'm calling you because I want to look like Cindy. And I said, well, who is Cindy? Can you tell me more about that? That's what it sounds very interesting. And well, Cindy is a, another person who I had worked with. She said, I've known Cindy all my life. and. I hadn't seen her for a couple months and the last time I saw her she was looking really run down and I just saw her the other day and she looks terrific and I asked her what happened and she said she came to see you. So I want to look like Cindy. <laughs> right. So what the mom really wanted is she wanted to not feel beaten up by the school for saying all the things that you know she was the mom was doing right or doing wrong or yeah. you know, she the mom was overwhelmed and she had a child who she really thought she couldn't help anymore yeah but um, when you can help the moms become more resilient then they're more helpful with their kids yeah. in ways and and they're better at sort of authentic independence for their kids they know when to help and and ask questions maybe that move their kids forward as opposed to when to dive in and try and save their kids yeah yeah so for instance, I get kids who have anxiety disorders referred to me, and you have to teach them how n not to um, start worrying about things to the point that they can't think about anything else. You can I schedule worry breaks, for example. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a positive way of looking at, at worrying. You know, you're worrying because you you care and you're concerned and you want things to, to go well and be better. Let's have a worry break. Yeah. So if you can teach the parent not to dive in and tell the kid, you don't have to worry about that, everything's going to be fine, I'll take care of that, but you know, you've know, you never had a problem with that before. Instead, what you get is a parent who says, let's take a worry break. Yeah. yeah. So there are little things like that. Right, right. Well, and what then happens after you've had initial phone call? So after the initial phone call, the um, it, it will depend on whether I actually have space to see somebody. Um, in some cases I will have the, the, a parent and a student come in together, say that they need to learn how to improve the way they are um, interfacing at home over homework. Uh, sometimes the mom and the, the student will come in together. Right. right. Um, and that will be an hour and a half of just having them bring whatever the, the, the particular topic is that they think would be most valuable for them to work on. They get to pick a topic. Yeah. Uh, but more likely than that I will be scheduling to see somebody for you know the for a semester. So most of the scheduling would happen for the fall, would happen in the summer, for example. I would already have people lined up, and they come on a regular basis for um, for the first semester. And then during that time, during the semester, some people will be finishing up their uh, time with me at the end of um, that 14 weeks or whatever. And um, some people will stay on. It will depend on what they need. Yeah. Um, and how uh, what would happen then is that then that the relationship is um, the student comes to see me for appointments you know after school if I do work with the parent a lot of times parents and kids need to be seen completely separately right and the um, the mom um, will come in sometimes with dad and they'll they want to know more about you know how does my child think and learn and um, what's a good approach to doing such and such and they bring their problems and then we look at at a different lens for how to solve problems by figuring out what's already working. And a yeah. lot of times, by the time someone comes to get help, they are very past what's already working. Right, right, yeah. So that's where you have to go back to. Right, right. And so, so, so in a session, do you have an agenda? What happens in a session? Everybody gets their own agenda. Uh, I don't have a, a fixed agenda on behalf of somebody, except for I would like to find out um, what the underlying um, real situation is 
where we can start making progress right away because if people can feel like they're making progress right away, they start seeing things through a new lens right away, then they're hooked and they want to do more of the work that needs to get done because right. it's not easy to, to be a coaching client. You're expected to, to you know dig in and be willing to make um, you know decisions based on a variety of choices that you may have so that you can move forward as opposed to wallowing in whatever you had or analyzing you know what your parents did to you that was horrible when you were a youngster or whatever and, and why you're entitled to the bad feelings that you have you really can't feel sorry for yourself when you're a coaching client mm -hmm. because the job of the coach is not to let you do that the job of the coach is to help you see what you've got to work with what resources do we have here where would we really like to go how are we going to use these resources to get there? It's kind of like that's where I am when I work with somebody. I, every person I see, I like. I think, oh, look what they've got to work with. It makes me very excited, actually. Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 and, and how does the coach engagement end? How does it end? Usually, the um, if it's a student, they start starting to feel like they don't need to come see me anymore. Sometimes that happens when it's not actually true, and they really do still need to come, well. but. Generally, um, we kind of have a, a feeling that we've covered what we need to cover in order for them to be uh, successful independently. Right. For parents, they usually, uh, I'd say maybe six visits is about what's necessary, and then we need maintenance, then, I, then there's check-ins, because I, of course I see them every time they bring their child to see me, yeah. so I can check in, I can ask them how the ACR is going, I can um, say to them, uh, how, how are you doing with your uh, positivity ratio or, or you know so once we have some language um, we can talk about strengths we can talk about the things that um, are the tools that they've learned yeah. and just kind of throw it back out there uh, it becomes part of what they're doing on a regular basis so it's not like the coaching engagement is happening in a formal way but informally um, uh, there's it's sort of like I become you know their leadership uh, person in the background who just I'm, I'm just uh, priming them to make sure they still use the things they need to, right, 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 to do. Right. And assessment, is that something you use? Yes, I love the VIA. I think everybody in the whole world should take the VIA. Don't make this extreme. But anyway, I love the VIA because it's all about not just what's good about a person, which, you know, Chris Peterson says, you know, it's that they were looking to see what is the good of a person. And there are lots of other ways that you could find the good of a person. But what's nice about the VIA is it's things that everybody can agree about are good about a person. And it's also answering questions about what you do. So it, it is a window into your values. So a lot of times kids think nobody understands how they feel. You know, you're not me. I mean, you may have said this when you were an adolescent too. I'm sure I did. Um, you're not me. You don't understand how I feel. Um, as if you're the only person in the whole world who ever had these feelings. And even when kids take the, the VA youth, they start to see that other people are like them, even just a little bit. And um, I do uh, dynamic family coaching sometimes, and everybody in the family will take the VA. And the cool thing about it is that you start to see that your siblings, who you have this incredible rivalry with, maybe the rivalry is because you both share a strength, and you both feel so strongly about that, and you value it so much. That that's where your button heads. Oh right, right, yeah, yeah. So that's one of my very favorite tools is the VIA, and I probably use, uh, I do use that with just about everybody. There are other things to do. I, the the uh, authentic happiness test. Um, if I were looking at somebody, where I really wanted to see if, if you know we were going to make them happier, but since I really don't focus on that so much, it's only really if I think that I that that's something that I would want to be able to show somebody as a result of what I've been doing with them. So. Um, mostly the VIA, that's what I stick with. And, and, and so how do you use it, like, how do you assign it, how do you give feedback on well, it? Well, I have people take it in my office usually because I want to make sure it's as clean an administration as possible, I, you know, no distractions, they can't ask anybody for answers. Hey mom, the question here says, what do you think I do? I don't want any of that, I want, you know, a nice clean uh, administration of it, and then we debrief it. And uh, I have, I divide the, um, the results, um, when we, uh, we print them out, sit down and go over them, I divide it into three different uh, categories, basically, the way it's laid out. I don't tell them a whole lot about what it's measuring, I don't want to influence the test results in any way. I um, really want them to have their debrief as, as immediately as possible after they've taken the test because I want the experience of having answered the questions and the debriefing to be very close together. Uh, right, yeah. I think that's really important as opposed to something that they take and then they have lots of other stuff in between and then they forget 
Yeah. So um, that's part of the debriefing. So we talk about their top strengths, their signature strengths, um, their best supporting strengths, which are what I call the strengths six through ten. And then we look at the strengths you didn't say um, you ha have as strongly, the things you didn't feel strongly about are the things that uh, are the ones with the higher numbers. We don't call them lesser strengths or we don't call them, you know, weaknesses or anything like that. These are the things that you, because and every kid will say, what's at the bottom? Yeah. Everyone. Because you know, they, what are they coming to see me? Because life is good, not necessarily. Mm. Um, but uh, kids will be very quick to tell me how they know they have a certain strength. So sometimes I'll get kids who are fantastic athletes and they do only very marginal work in school. They're always kind of hovering in the D plus C minus range and they get referred to me really because they're struggling in school. Uh, and it turns out they've got a lot more to offer, but they um, have, sometimes they have who knows what, you know, it could be organization or attention or other learning problems. But a lot of times these kids are very modest. They don't go for extra help at school because they don't want to draw any attention to themselves. They are kids who are offended by other people who, you know, they make the goal and they, you know, put the hockey stick over their head and they spin around the rink and these kids don't like that. So they don't want any attention drawn to themselves. They don't want to be with people who, so they're not going to, going to approach somebody like that and say, can you help me study? You know, what are you, what are you planning for this particular test? Um, gee, you want to be my lab partner? So they tend to um, reduce their circle of friends um, as a result. But when they understand that, that modesty is a good thing, and they, they're able to talk about being modest, they're able to say, wow, this is keeping me from something that might be helping. Yeah. The, just getting them to be able to go and ask for extra help. Like I won't say, I want you to raise your hand in class. You know, I will say, what do you think might help? And we have, we'll get a list of choices, and then they have to make a single decision that they act on yeah. as a result of that particular coaching session. I have organizational tools where they have to um, learn how to plan in advance for um, how they're going to actually accomplish one of those uh, decisions that they make, how they have to lay it out into uh, a planner that's going to make sure that they actually follow up so that I'm not relying on them to just remember things. We build technology tools into their coaching. What like, like um, oh, For instance, having you know, an iPhone, right? So if you have your iPhone and you, have, um, you set up your Google Calendar and you have alerts on it, you can put anything at all that you want to be reminded about in there and it will remind you. So if the one important thing you have to do and you need to do it every single day is you need to uh, put your assignments into uh, Google Calendar, then it's going to remind you that you have to do that, and yeah. you just and you can do it every day. But even if it's just one thing, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I do this with college students, for example. Um, distance, they either email me or call me. I, they could be in college, you know, anywhere in the world, um, and they learn how to organize themselves, how to give yourself an assignment. Uh, it doesn't. So once you've made your decision from your you know, the array of choices you have, the choice, you know, you have the choice to. Uh, pet the dog, uh, get some ice cream, play video games. I mean, to kids, there are an, a vast array of choices, and any of those is going to have a consequence. And if you don't make sure that do you know my homework is on the choice list, right. then you may never make the decision to getting where you are. So you have to plan ahead for that and make yourself an assignment, right, not right. the assignment that comes from the teacher, no. but the assignment that you give to yourself because that's more valuable. Yeah. Well, if the assignment that you give to yourself is go to extra help and um, then you need to know what you're going to ask for when you get there, what help will you need. So then you have to work backwards from that and kids have to say, oh, well, what I really need help on is, um, you know, learning how to, um, you know, go to, I don't know, I'm thinking of, thinking of math things, but, um, you know, learning how to provide specific evidence for my thesis statement and my essay and uh, or learning how to analyze uh, character traits or whatever. Yeah. And, you have to be able to go to the teacher and you have to have a language for asking for that. You have to not be embarrassed when you're doing that. Um, so you have to see that your modesty is something that's, that's a value uh, add for you, not something that's keep, been keeping you from doing what you need to do and yeah. learn how to use it in a new way. Um, the other thing is if maybe you know, teamwork is a great strength for, for the, this student who has modesty. And meanwhile, you were only in the top five. And you know, most kids have teamwork as a strength. They want to be part of their peer group, but they don't see that adults are part of the team. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you need to go ask for extra help from the teacher? You need to know that the teacher is going to be on your team. Yeah. So um, if you go to extra help on a regular basis, the teacher is going to think that you want them on the team. Right. So one of the things I get kids to say is, I'm going to go to extra help because I want the teacher to think I care. Right, right, right. And kids can say this back to me, but 
they'll also say, isn't that like lying? <laughs> I'll say, well, no. Don't you want the teacher to think you care? Well, I don't know if I want the teacher to think I care. I said, well, let's just go with it. Let's just decide that you do want the teacher to think you care. And, you know, next week I want you to report back to me after you've gone to extra help. I want you to let me know. And eventually the teacher does think that the student cares, and the teacher will go to the student and say, I want you to um, come for extra help tomorrow because the test is on Thursday, and if you come tomorrow, then um, I can show you some of the things that you're going to need to know, and we'll just check and make sure you have all your skills together. Right, right. Well, then you have the teacher on board. The kid yeah. thinks the teacher is on the team. The, te the, the student does better. They bring home a better test grade. The parent is excited. After a while, it's all good. Right, right, right. And it all is because the child understands that being modest is not a bad thing and that all these other people who are drawing all attention to themselves, that's fine. That's, that's something that's good about the way they operate and this is a good thing about me. Right, right, right. But that's only just going through the top five. Then you can start learning how to make strengths teams, or you can learn how, since strengths don't live by themselves, I, um, Robert Biswas Diener is all about the idea that uh, strengths are integrated and more dynamic, and I absolutely agree. So you, you don't just have a list, a static list. You have a list that's always moving around in some way, but there's some things that are you know, more about how you are than other things are. So we learn about that too. And, and strengths teams, can you tell me about how, how you work with that? Um, well, there's a, so people don't always use their powers for good. I like to think of Darth Vader, for example, as someone who did not use, you know, he, he the, the, the force was strong with that one, you know, in, in, in Luke Skywalker, but, you know, Darth Vader, he was, uh, he had the force too, but he was a bad guy. So um, sometimes kids are not using their powers for good. An example would be uh, somebody who has a strength of bravery, humor, and social intelligence might be a class clown. Yeah. And those kids need to understand that they have these great strengths, but they might not be using those powers for good. Right. right. So that's a strengths team. How can I use that team to get me more of something else that I want? Yeah. So to get more of what it is that you want, you have to be able to know what it is that you want. Maybe what you want is lots of attention. Yeah. Maybe what you want is uh, to um, take attention away from the task at hand because you don't really understand what's going on in class anyway. So if you have the attention be all about you, then the, uh, the classroom doesn't really progress a whole lot in terms of content and everybody will love you for that too. So that, that's often the perception of the funny kid. Yeah. I'm doing everybody a favor, including myself. Right, right, right. So that would be an example of a team, but you can certainly turn that around. So uh, say somebody really uh, could potentially have lots of leadership. If you can see that that is a strength that could be developed, you can develop leadership with the kid who's brave. That's great because people want to, you know, not only will they want to follow that, that kid, they also see that kid as somebody really admirable. If they're funny, that you know is transcendent. You can kind of get over the humps of difficult things. Um, if they have great social intelligence, then people like them, and they um, are good at forging new and maintaining existing relationships with people. So there you have a kid who could become the class president. Yeah. You know? But yet you have to make sure that you um, help them understand that they have this great set of strengths and that they can use that as a team. Right, right, right. And are other ways you work with the VIA and the strengths? Oh, well, since I use it with everybody and I've worked with thousands of people, it would be endless. Um, I'm, so typically? So, I'm not, I think the big thing is to help people understand that they, there are great and wonderful things about them and that they often think of those things as um, either they don't think of them at all. It's like breathing. It doesn't exist. You don't know about it until you're choking. Um, or. I think sometimes people think that a strength that they have is actually some sort of a liability. So if you are, uh, if you're somebody who is highly creative, but you're um, in a you know, a work environment, like if you're a teacher who's highly creative, for example, you are expected to do what it is that they tell you to do and to follow the curriculum. You know, if today is Tuesday, this must be Paris, kind of thing. Um, a lot of times. If you, when you come to understand that the reason you're feeling so, uh, so choked by your job is that creativity is really important to you, you can learn to find other venues for expressing your creativity outside of your work. Right. For students, um, I tell them that you need to be able to go to your teacher and say, um, I read the directions and I understand that this is what you want. I'm wondering if it would be okay if such and such because I'd like to try a creative way of doing it. And most of the time, if you approach a teacher that way, the teacher will say, at least they'll say, let me think about it. Even if they don't say, you know, they won't say no. They might not say, oh, what a great idea. Every now and then you'll get one that will do that. But at least they won't shut you down completely. Yeah. Whereas if you turn it in and you don't follow the directions, they're just going to take off points or they're going to say, 
next time follow directions or in big red letters see me <laughs> yeah. you're trying to avoid that yeah and you're trying to forge a better relationship so using the via for that, those uh, tools is good too starting to see something about yourself that's feeling painful um, I call these strengths buttons it's like you have a big you know hit me on, the, on your arm there and, and so it might be uh, appreciation of beauty and excellence and you know for instance I drove onto the campus here and it's very beautiful and right away I feel you know just uplifted how exciting and beautiful what a wonderful day even though it's cloudy or, you know because it's just beautiful yeah and um, if you so say you have that as a strength and you um, your commute to work every day is just such you know it's horrible so you might have to find a way to address that because you can't spend your whole day commuting all the way in an hour and a half of misery on the highway or whatever you're doing and feeling like someone's pushing your beauty and excellence button. So either you need to not commute, which would be like the huge uh, approach to that, or get a different job, or maybe you'd find, you know, you would listen to uh, a book on, um, you know, your MP3 player, or you would have music in the car, or you would um, ride with a friend and have uh, have conversation because you also have social intelligence, or yeah, yeah. it could be a lot of other things you could do. So it's learning that something about yourself that you think is a problem doesn't need to be fixed. It's actually great and wonderful, and you're just going to use it in a new way. Right, right, right. And, and, and using a new way, that's one of the interventions. Uh, in, yes. So, so, so can you tell me about the interventions that you use? So uh, I, I use um, lots of interventions. Um, some of them are not um, exactly the way they are scripted because I find it's, it, what works well is to take um, what I know about positive psychology and education and you know, neuropsychological development and all those other things and kind of put all that stuff together and create an intervention. Ha having said that though, there's some that I, I do use uh, pretty consistently. So one would be my version of three good things. Um, every student in their assignment book um, has to put down the numbers one, two, and three and they learn that that stands for what happened, what was good about it, why did it happen. So they just write down, and it doesn't even have to be a complete sentence, it can just be a little phrase. They have to write down for me, um, oh, you know, uh, got B plus on um, my algebra test. You know, so what was good about that? Um, what was good about it is last time I failed, big improvement. Why did it happen? I went to extra help and made myself a practice test and took it before the test. So they are starting to make connections between their behavior toward whatever their goal is. So this gets back to the goal setting thing. So making a connection between their behavior and who they are and what they bring to the table to be able to get more of what it is that they want. So I had a lot of choices. I decided not to play video games and not to go and eat a second bowl of ice cream and you know not to take a nap and not to feel sorry for myself. Instead, I did these other things and this is the outcome that I got. Right, right. But they're also recording that. So it's not just that they are thinking this. They're actually recording it and then we can go back and look at it. So the other thing that I do with that is look at the uh, perma dimensions and see, you know, was it a pleasurable thing that got me more of what I wanted? Sometimes it is, you know, maybe, you know, you did whatever the thing is that was your good thing was a pleasure thing. Is it an engagement thing? I was doing something, I lost complete track of time. Uh, is it a relationship thing? Um, something I was doing with my friends or my family or whatever. Was it a, um, a meaning thing, something that I'm doing because it really matters to me? Um, I, um, you know, my dog was sick and I was responsible for making sure that she got her medication and I went with my mom to the vet and, you know, so there's that piece. And then there's the achievement part. And I have kids code their own um, three good things by also putting down the different dimensions of PERMA that they're working on. And after a while, kids have a pattern. Uh, you'll see whether you have somebody who really needs a lot, lots of pleasure in their life. You know, like I don't have to give them the pathways to happiness, which is now outdated. I can have them kind of make their own pathways to happiness by mapping PERMA onto the three good things. And we also pick strengths that they like. So I can put those three things together. I can have the three good things as the what they're coding. They can decide what strengths they were using. So say that the, um, the good thing was I uh, went to my friend's birthday party. Maybe we'll, the, and they have a strength of social intelligence and teamwork. Maybe they're going to put down that those are the, the strengths that they thought that they used, and then they'll be able to go through their permanent dimensions and pick out, you know, well, we you know, did this for fun, and it was, I had a really great time, so that was a pleasure thing. Uh, or maybe they um, went and played, oh, I don't know, um, paintball or something, and uh, you know, this particular kid won, so they got you know, an achievement in their PERMA. 
and but kids start to make very uh, direct connections between their own behavior and these other dimensions of, of uh, things that I have sort of turned into uh, an integrated intervention for them. Right, right, that, right. So that would be an example of a one way that I do it. Right. And other things that you do, like other interventions you use, either pure interventions or... Uh, okay, let's way. see. So um, I teach kids um, active constructive responding for managing their parents. So instead of actually using it for um, just, you know, improving your relationship, I get them to understand that maybe, you know, your, your mom's been at work all day, and by the time she gets home, she really doesn't want to know that you have homework or you have a project or you're telling her that you've got to go to... Um, I don't know, to, you have to go off to AC more to get all of your, your materials for your project, which you've known about for a month, but you're just getting around to doing now. I said, you know, imagine if you were your mother, how might you feel about that? And what I want the, the, uh, the child to be able to do is to check in with the mom and find out how the mom's day went. Wow. So I, I want you to think, I said, what do we want you, you uh, to have the teacher think? You want the teacher to think I care. I said, right, what do you want your mom to think? You want my mom to think I care. Right, good, let's go with that. So let's see if you can help figure out with me how we're gonna get your mom to think you care and what's in it for you. So when you get them to see there's something good in it for them, they're much more willing to try right, it out. Right, right, right. So we learn ACR. And we go through, I show them the little box, the little four uh, ways you can respond, and we come up with all kinds of really funny things. And they and it variably, the kids will say, you know, um, passive constructive, you know, but but that's being polite. I'm being polite when I just say that's nice when my mom tells me about something that happened in her day. That's nice. So, but that's a, like a real conversation ender, you know? It's like you could just put up a big stop sign. Yeah. So I want you, you know, green light thinking we call it. So I want you to make green light thinking with, with your mom. And then you're going to do this every day, at least once every day, between now and the next time you see me. And then you're going to report back. And they'll report back and they'll be amazed. <laughs> yeah. So that would be one. Uh, another example, let's see. Um, not all of my students um, or my adult clients either, and we haven't talked about what I do when I go into a school yet, but we can talk about that too. Um, but uh, So we're just talking about kids and families at this point. Um, would be um, adaptations of the ABCDE from, um, from the resilience training. So I have a simpler version of that. I had um, little kids, you know, second graders, who I wanted to learn basics of, um, of, you know, more flexible and accurate thinking. So I came up with a simpler way of just thinking about, you know, so um, it only has three steps in it instead of having five steps. I'm not asking them to, to match up things in quite, you know, the level of complexity. So I've created a new intervention out of that intervention so that it can be um, more age level appropriate, depending on what level of um, complexity they're actually able to to, uh, to do. So that's something that I think is important, though, is to helping kids be you know more flexible and accurate thinking. So I'm thinking of a girl who had just taken her um, her high stakes testing, um, her test in the spring. This was uh, two springs ago, and she came in to see me, sobbing, sobbing tears. I'm the stupidest girl in fourth grade. I am the stupidest. Sobbing, 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 sobbing. Beautiful little girl. And I, I said to her, can you tell me more about that? And she told me that she was, I was the second to the last kid in my class to finish. The second to the last. I'm the stupidest girl. And the, uh, the person who finished last was a boy, so she was the stupidest girl. But, you know, she was the stupidest kid. But by talking her through, first of all, was this accurate? I said to her, um, did you answer all the questions? Yes. Did you, you know, and, uh, but just by asking her questions, just get her to start thinking about whether or not what she was saying was true. Um, and eventually, and, you know, she got to where she was able to say, you know, I said, are you very hardworking? I am very hardworking, I, but I'm so stupid. I said, well, um, you're hardworking and did you do your very best work? Well, of course I did. I said, do you always do your very best work? Always, always, always. I said, well, um, so do people who, who you think are stupid, are they very hard workers? Of course not. 
<laughs> okay, so usually you can get them to refute their own thinking. Um, you could walk them through a, a, a procedure and teach them that, but a lot of times what they really need to do is they need to just learn to be more accurate. And you just ask them, is that, what, why might that not be true? Yeah. yeah. So even with little kids. So that's something that I use a lot, but in some um, variation on that theme. Right, right, right. With adults or with older kids, it's easier to, um, to go through more of an A, B, C, D, E. In Smart Strengths, we have a, a different approach that we use called Ramp Up. Um, I have one that I call the T-Cycle that uh, looks at how you think uh, and feel and, and what you do. They're, and they're just all using the same um, research constructs and they're just different names of things, which I think yeah. is what happens with interventions. It's what, however got scripted. It's the, based on whatever the theories are. So it's all the same stuff, at least in my mind. There's, there might be you know, little tweaks that happen that make it be more effective for somebody. Right, right, right. And, and, and those tweaks, can you say more about that? About tweaking things? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, for example, um, last weekend was the MAP Summit. Yeah. And um, Marty talked about X then Y as you know, humans as future-oriented people as opposed to um, past or present-oriented. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I thought, well, this is really very interesting because what I really want my kids to do in goal setting is I want them to be able to think about what their choices are so they can make a decision so they can move, move forward. So for, I, have a, uh, I have middle schoolers and I thought, oh, I'm going to try this out. So a lot of times if I have an intervention potential, that something I think I can make, I'll try it out yeah. based on whatever the latest and greatest thing is that I've just heard and I'll be like, oh, cool, let's do it. So I'm, I had uh, X, you know, leads to Y. And, I, and X were the, all the different possible choices, and in the middle was, um, you know, we're leading towards something, was whatever the decision that you had to make. When you got to Y, you made a decision. So we had choices and decisions, and then we had whatever the goal was. So no matter where you are, uh, X um, leads to Y, and then there's some outcome, some, um, yeah. some consequence. So that's why I, the ABC language is sometimes um, confusing, because a consequence is an emotion. And kids uh, think that all consequences are negative. You know, uh, uh, I got a consequence for that. My right. teacher says, they're all, my mother says, it's going to be a consequence for that behavior, whatever. And no one ever hears that a consequence is something good. So we call them outcomes sometimes, you know, right, or, right. or a result. Right. Well, that's great. So that's kind of, uh, that's a, a new intervention uh, in some ways because it's, it's and any intervention is you're taking someone's way of thinking and feeling and changing it just a little bit so that they uh, have a new window on whatever their situation is so they can make a different choice yeah. and different decision as a result. Right, 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 right. What about knowledge sharing? Do you, do you share some of your knowledge when you coach people? Uh, I'm sure I do all the time because when I, if you ask people about me, they'll say, oh, she's very intelligent, she knows so many things, whatever. So I'm sure I'm doing this even when I'm not aware of how I'm doing it. Here while I'm having a conversation with you, uh, all the time I would. Um, you know, if I have somebody who is um, resisting doing something that they really need to do, um, I might say to them, you know, let me tell you something interesting. There, um, I'm trying to think, think of one right now that I would, I would uh, share. Oh, okay, so mindsets comes to mind. That's a good one. Um, so kids will come and tell me, you know, that, you know, like I'm the stupidest kid in class or, you know, everybody else is smarter than I am. And I'll say, well, you know, let me tell you an interesting story and I'll tell them about, um, you know, smart is what you, you do, not smart is what you are. But I'll come up with some story, and, I'll, and sometimes I make the story up right off the top of my head, but it's based on whatever the research is. So I'm sharing research with them, but I'm doing it in the form of a story so that they start to see, or it could be a student that I have actually worked with. I yeah. can say, you know, so, um, you know, Caroline my, uh, was a, a student I had, and, you know, she's from such and such a town, and, um, and she um, had been told when she was little that she had all these different problems that she was going to have to face in school and the teachers really didn't expect it much out of her and nobody thought that she was going to mount to anything and it turned out that she ended up you know graduating from high school and then she went on to college and she went on to law school and now she's doing this and this and this I said you know so you could hear lots and lots of stories about people going off and doing great and wonderful things but the difference was that she didn't believe when people told her that smart was what she was she believed that smart was what she did right. so what are things that you do that are smart so that's, you know, there's, that's taking the research and telling them a story, the research through a story that makes it possible to then develop an intervention that will work for that person. Right, right, right. And when you say develop an intervention, 
How, how do you develop it? How would I develop it? Well, it, so it, say that the idea of mindsets is really suddenly very appealing and, and the kid perks right up. Then I can figure out what, uh, what steps are we going to take? What activity can I develop that I'm going to have them use over a certain amount of time to make progress toward whatever the goal is that they want? So if it is um, mindset, they, they may have to tell me what they did as opposed to what they are. They might have to do right. it over and over right. and over right. again. Right. 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 So the, the way to get from the theory to the practice, you know, for the, the client, for the client to actually use things, they need to be able to go from um, understanding that a real person did this, and also believe me, like they have to trust me. If they don't yeah. trust me, then you know, no, they'll no. just think I'm you know, babbling. Um, they have to trust me that they're going to get from this idea that, that, that uh, there's a story that somebody else like you did this then there has to be a behavior that's attached to that and the behavior has to be attached to some sort of um, theoretical research basis otherwise we're just you know yeah. whatever you yeah. know it's not a nice idea but it's not tied to something that we know a lot about mm. and then we can create for that particular person a unique spin on whatever an intervention might be right right right, right, right. And a lot of times it goes back to uh, making sure that they're keeping track of it in, you know, three good things where we know, you know, what happened, what was good about it, and why it happened. All these things are all linked. Like, I don't just pick one thing. No, no. Right. More dynamic than that. Yeah. I, I, and and can, can you say something about, in general, about, the, you know, dynamics? So I have this question about flexibility, how, how to adapt things. Uh, to, to clients, context, stuff like that? Well, so um, one of the ways I do that, so if I'm going into a, a school setting, so I'm doing institutional coaching, I might have uh, two people who work closely together and I will work with them individually and, I, and they will all say to me, you know, is, is it okay if I, if I tell you some confidential things? So I'll get confidential information from both parties. Neither one of them knows how much I know about the situation and how they feel about it and what their perception of it is. And then I facilitate um, coaching with each of them that makes it possible for each of them without knowing that the other one knows this to be able to um, reach uh, some point where they can begin to dialogue or they can begin to um, you know, take a different approach to uh, a project that they're working on together or maybe change the way. So there's a, um, this one comes to mind too. Um, job crafting and job crafting um, there's a whole intervention for that through um, the Ross School of Business at University of Michigan. Um, you're trying to get people to think differently about the way they do their work. Well, if you have two people who, are, um, who work in uh, the same setting or maybe the, the same department or whatever, you might be able to make it possible for them to completely change the way they, um, they actually do the tasks that they do. Uh, you might still have, uh, there might be a hierarchy, there, you might have a department uh, head and you might have a teacher, for example, or uh, you could have the, the department head and um, maybe there's an administrative assistant. And there's some hierarchy there, but I can help people figure out separately and then eventually we get them to where they can do this together once they don't hate each other anymore. You can make it possible for people to see in new ways and, and flexibly how they could do their job differently um, based on what their strengths are. Yeah. Um, and that they start to see that when they use their strengths in new ways, that they're happier. When they're happier, they uh, want to, you know, they're more willing to turn toward the other person instead of turn away. So, so, so when, when you adapt things or, or create interventions based on the theory, do you, uh, do you have some rules of thumb that you follow, principles or something? Like, I, if, if other people w would want to start adapting things, what, what, what should they kind of have in mind? Um, well, I think always you, the, the, uh, the safety of your client is important. You wouldn't want to have them do something or try something that you don't think would be helpful. And you know, if they have a goal which is um, not appropriate, then um, maybe they need to get referred out for therapy or something. You know? right. you know, so certainly that would be the first thing is first do no harm. Yeah. And then um, I guess there's so much out there in, in terms of research, things that preceded what we call positive psychology, you know, um, self-efficacy and self-determination theory. There's, there's so much out there that as long, I feel like as long as you're drawing from things that are essentially good and about the good of a person and you are um, 
filtering this through the strengths that you know the person who you're working with actually has and you do things in baby steps and each time that you're checking in there is demonstrable progress then you're doing a good thing yeah and if you're not don't do that right 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 right, right. so i'm not completely making things up um uh off the top of my head everything is very much rooted in my at this point really broad knowledge base and i'm very open to the many different possible things that can work um for the, for smart strengths smart is an acronym for um, how we use strengths um, in this particular model. So we learn to spot strengths, manage strengths, um, advocate for what you need with strengths, which I talked about how having kids go in and talk to their teachers or having um, you know, teachers and students talk together, uh, whatever. Um, and for relationship building and for training your strengths so that you learn how to use your powers for good on a more regular basis. So there's a model that's created out of all the theories and I don't even know how many um, citations there are in the book. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So it's all built on yeah. the existing research, yet it's a very simple model that we take even into um, elementary schools. Right, right, right. So, so it's a hard question to answer because a lot of what I do is something that I, where I couldn't really separate what the theory is from what the practice is. Right, right, right. right. Because it's something that I do every day and I've been doing it for years and years before it even had the name positive psychology. Yeah. yeah. I have some questions about factors that might contribute to, to the outcome. Uh, one of them is about uh, credibility or expectations. So, so do you do something to, to create credibility you know, for you or the way that you work or something? Well, I've been doing what I do for a very long time so my credibility sort of precedes me and uh, it's rare that somebody will just find me randomly on the internet. For the most part, I get referrals from other people who know me or, you know, down the road, you know, they know me and they knew me and they knew me or somebody said, told somebody who told somebody who told somebody. Or people uh, see me in at a speaking engagement or, uh, you know, now that I have uh, been published, they see my name and my picture on the back of a book and they picked up at a bookstore. But so I have credibility that comes from just having been around for a long time, I think. If I were just starting this today from, from scratch, I don't know um, what my credibility would be to, in the world because MAP, for example, is something that, that people don't know about. Yeah. When you tell them about it, they don't understand um, you know, calling something positive psychology or positive psychology coaching or whatever is um, is confusing to people. I think they don't understand why you would be coming to them for negative coaching. So they just right away they you know turn it around. Yeah. So I really think that my credibility comes from you know at least initially people call me because they've already heard that I'm the person that they need. Right, right, right. And then you know once they work with me, it is the rare person who says, "Oh, you're not what I'm looking for." Right, right, right. Because right. I have a pre-selected group of people right, right, right. who get to me in the first place. And, and when you work with them, how, how do you establish a good relationship and maintain it? That's easy, I think, because I, I like them. I like people and I find them endlessly fascinating and I like kids and m one of my favorite things to do is to work with somebody. I get a new st uh, student this afternoon after I'm finished talking to you. My favorite one is when the, the mother pulls up and gets out of the car, you know, shakes my hand. But by that time, I've already spoken with the mother, you know, several times on the phone. We've done email contact and maybe, you know, I've met her, you know, at, briefly at my office because she's handed me paperwork because her child's previously been tested or, you know, things I need to know before I actually meet the child in person. And, uh, and this, you know, 15-year-old boy gets out of the car and mom says, good luck with that one. Uh, you know, and, and you know, he doesn't want to be here. I had to drag him here, kicking and screaming. But then they usually leave happy because it's all about them, and and I'm telling them that they, that I value the things they value about themselves, or I'm helping them understand what's good about them, that they feel is good about them, but nobody else has noticed is good. So it's pretty easy to get them on your side just by having that appreciative approach. Yeah. Instead of. You know, they might bring their backpack with everything in it. Chances are that first time I see them, I don't say, oh, you know, I think we need to go through that backpack. I think we need to see, you know, what's, what's your organizational style? I'm not looking for anything wrong. The first time I meet them, especially, it's what's good about you. I don't ask that question. I tell them what's good about them. Right, right, right. So. And how, how, how do you spot what's good about them? Like, so, oh, so, so to be able to tell 
That's, this is a great question. Uh, I think it's just easy. For instance, somebody who gives me a really hard time, um, you know, somebody might, might think they're being belligerent, but I think that they're, they could be being lots of other things. Who knows what else it might be? So I don't look at the bad thing, whatever it is. And I find this is much more energizing for me than trying to figure out why are they being so nasty. Well, they're being nasty because they don't want to be there. Yeah. So what, how can we figure out what would make it good and valuable for them to be there? Right, 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 right. While they're sitting there going, <laughs> <laughs> or, or worse, whatever it is. Right, yeah, right. I mean, every now and then I have a story that I tell about uh, a boy named James who um, had been to seven other people before he'd seen me. He'd burned through all the other people. And his mother brought him in, and he was crying, and they obviously had it. It's a major blow-up fight before they ever showed up in my office. This is the first time I'd ever seen him. And I had two chairs that, uh, you know, office chairs that kind of spin around. And his mother sort of threw him in the room, and, you know, that was it. She was out the door. And he sat down, and I said, you know, I, I understand you've worked with lots of people before me. So what I want to know is what are your goals for working with me? And he had his back to me at this point. He spun around in the chair and he spat in my face. Like I, and I didn't you know, go to wipe it off or whatever. He spat in my face. And I said, well, I want you to know that my goal, because he, and he said after he spat at me, he said, my goal was to never see your face again. <laughs> and I said, no. Well, that's my goal for working with you too. I want to make it so you don't have to come here anymore. What can we do to make that happen? There's so many good things about you. And then he actually worked with me for four years because he was, at that point, he was 13 years old and he couldn't read. So we had a lot of work to do. Right, right, right. But he was plenty smart. He had lots to work with and smart is what you do. And he saw that. He eventually went to Muhlenberg College. He went to real school. And I don't know what happened to him after that. Right. So that's good. When I don't hear anymore, it's usually it's good. Yeah. Otherwise, they call me back. <laughs> right, 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 right. What about uh, client engagement? Like in between the sessions where you see people... Uh, can, do you do something to help them stay engaged in the process of working towards their goals? Well, it depends on, uh, again, what it is they need. Sometimes, if it's a, a student, for example, the teacher is giving them things to do. Right. So they have authentic work that I'm not assigning to them as part of a, you know, a, an add-on coaching process. Yeah. And they're motivated, um, eventually, to start using what they learn by working with me. In terms of skills and strategies that are academic in nature, as also uh, and also the ones that are positive psychology based in nature, they become motivated to use them because it makes a difference. Right. They're actually excited. They'll come in and they'll say, oh, "You'll never guess what I did." Yeah. Which is you know very different than when I didn't have positive psychology specific uh, uh, coaching to add to what I was already doing. Right. Although I I I think I got great results all along because I was probably doing these things even though I didn't know that they had these names. Yeah. 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 Do you do other things to, to help them stay engaged? Okay, so uh, email. They're allowed to send me things that they're working on. Yeah. Um, if so, so someone's learning how to improve their written language skills uh, and they email me their papers, when I send comments back you know, in the, um, the insert comments on, on their Word document, I can make sure that I respond to them in appreciative ways or ask them what questions instead of, why did you do that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what are you thinking about here? You know, that's so I can get them to respond to me. Yeah. So that's one thing. Uh, for college students who are uh, away from home, I work with them distance. Um, the the way to get them engaged is that they um, have notations in their Google Calendar. They have to be willing to share their Google Calendar with me. But I can just go in and see that they're uh, doing the different things they need to do. You know, I here are the ways I use my strengths today. Or like I was telling you earlier about. Yeah, I'm integrating um, PERMA with your three good things. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Right, right, right. And what's the feedback you get from clients? What's most helpful? Well, the feedback I get is they hug me a lot. Right. Actually. Um, even a lot of times it will be a mom will hug me uh, on the way out the door after the first uh, meeting. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I feel so blessed to be here, which is really nice. It means you know they're sharing gratitude. I feel grateful for having the privilege of working with them. They feel grateful for having the privilege of working with me. It's all really very nice. Right, right, right. So that's one thing. And then you had another question. Well, so, 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 so what's most helpful? Uh, the things that you do, like what do they mention? The, this really helped me. I think it's much more global. I don't think that they pick a, one particular intervention that they love. Right. Everybody likes strengths. They all like that. 
because you're just you are developing a language for talking differently about yourself and you can use uh, your strengths even when things aren't going well you can sometimes understand that it didn't go well because I was not using my something strength well you know right, right. whatever it's fairness you know you pushed my fairness button it really made me angry um, it's just nice you it takes you one step back it depersonalizes things so that's something that everybody likes right. but I do think it is the integration of all the different kinds of things that just make people feel hopeful that it's not always going to be bad and that I um, I'm a, a person with lots of resources um, and I'm resilient and I can be more accurate in my thinking and when I'm more accurate then I can be flexible about what I think about things and I can just get myself out of the mess that I'm in. I can learn to schedule my worrying because worrying is eating up a lot of my time and so there's a lot of those things but it's a, an integration of that and, and eventually it gets to the place where these people are not going to be positive psychology practitioners, that's not really the job. They use the language that uh, of it that stays appealing to them, they use the behaviors that stay appealing to them, and then they move on. Right, right, right. And some of them I, you know, I will have keep in touch with me, and some of them I don't ever hear from again. Right, right, right. And you have to be okay with that too, especially because you're, I, I will tell kids who will say, how long am I going to have to come here? I'll say, well, my job is to work myself out of a job, so I need to make it with your help to uh, have you not need to come here anymore. So. You know, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. You, you tell me what you need and what works for you, and we'll try to do the best we can to get more of that. Right, right, right. And how do they respond to that? Usually, at least it diffuses whatever their yang 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 is. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. I don't really have kids who refuse to come and see me, and they absolutely will not come, will not come, will not come. Very rarely. If they do, it's there's something else going on. It's not really about having them come see me. They have other stuff going on. Right, right, right. And and, and how can you tell that they're progressing? Well, if it's uh, say that I'm working with uh, adults with teachers in a, um, in an institutional coaching engagement, that they can tell you, wow, um, I I'm thinking about doing my work uh, in whole new ways. Uh, wow, instead of getting stuck working with Andrea over here. You know, Andrea and I just came up with a great plan, something we're working on together. Uh, it turns out that Andrea is really good. So sometimes I use the Strengths Finder, uh, especially in an institutional setting. Um, so it turns out that Andy, Andrea is really great at uh, arranging and you know, I have been looking at her and thinking she micromanages everything I do instead of saying, wow, Andrea is really good at arranging things. I'm going to let her do it. Yeah. So sometimes that's what happens. You just get people to start saying whatever it was that was the sort of the bump in the road for them. They are now just so able to get over that bump in the road. They be able to learn how to go around it or go over it or through it, whatever it is, and they feel like they are very um, competent now as a, as a team, and they didn't used to be. Right, right, right. With uh, with kids and families, um, in in my case, generally speaking kids get referred to me because they're not doing well in school for some reason and, yeah. it, and it often has nothing to do with their skills it has to do with other stuff yeah disengagement so once they're re-engaged and their grades go back up then I don't see them again right, right, right. the hardest thing I think for parents is being willing to let their their students go fly solo if they really don't have academic issues that require the learning specialist part of me and that they really can be flying solo a lot of times I'll say to parents I think it's time to go it's out of the nest and they don't want that because there's a sort of a safety factor so sometimes um, a client will get very attached to me right. and I have to make them leave right right, right 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 and how do you do that basically I tell them there's not going to be a spot available for them during the next semester right <laughs> right right yeah uh, you have to do it nicely I mean I have to say to them you know how much progress has been made so I have to sit down and I we do a before and after and looking forward here's what it is that uh, will be expected of your child and here are all the things that your child brings to the table as a family look at how much progress you've made I can tell them that but, but, but they need to tell me their progress so that they leave feeling like they're ready to go on without me right 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 and what do you think could be some of the mechanisms causing the changes that you see well I actually try not to think a whole lot about these things because I think as a practitioner there's sort of a line between what is um, what's the magic that makes it the, in the relationship 
that's is maybe not magical. Of course, you can unpack almost everything if you're you know good enough at that sort of thing. But it doesn't help me be a more effective practitioner. I don't think to to understand what mechanisms I might be using in order to be able to get what I know will work. So. Um, there's a, uh, an intuitive side of a practitioner who's done something for a very long time. I have more tools at my disposal than I could ever hope to use with people. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not ever stumped by somebody who shows up and needs something unless I think the person really needs to go into therapy. I'm No coaching person is going to show up at my door who I think I cannot help in some way unless I don't have the domain specific knowledge. You know, if they show up and they're, you know, it's a, they're a neurosurgeon I may not be able to help them if what they really want is help in that understanding right, right, life right. in that domain because I don't have that domain experience. But generally speaking, for the work that I do since I get a self-selecting population, I don't find that um, I that I really think about that. I don't. Right, right. I don't find that I worry about what the mechanism might be. Right, right. Do you have some guesses? Do I have some guesses? Um, well. Um, so in the, like the means and nutrients department of, of uh, is that what you're talking about? So what are the, the means could be the various interventions and the fact that we're um, building positive emotion and we're building optimism and resilience and we're learning how to use our strengths in new ways. Those um, would be the means, the actual things we're doing. The nutrients of that though are the are, uh, broadening and building positive emotion, certainly, that um, the um, resilience factor, um, you know, if we look at what that actually means, is also broadening and building. I think it's the broadening and building is is the that becomes uh, a self um, fertilizing uh, set of events that grow out of the the means that we use. Right, 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 right. And, and what, what I could give you something that was more scientific, but I don't do that, so I don't want to. <laughs> no, no. That's not my my piece. Right. And what, what, what do you do to change, uh, to, to kind of develop as a professional? Uh, I, I don't get to know, go to every single conference that there is, but boy, it would be fun to go to more of them. But I go waiting for that next something that I can integrate. So last weekend um, at the uh, Positive Psychology Summit, Marty was talking about um, uh, X and Y, you know, uh, the idea that people are future oriented, you have where, whatever X is and it's leading you toward Y. And right away I saw that that was connected to goal setting. Yeah. And as soon as I decided that, that was about goal setting, I decided that I, that was something very simple and any student who's been introduced to X and Y in algebra right away, that was something that would be, you know, a, a little um, an analogous learning uh, situation and I could start turning that into something. So I tried it out. It's, a, it's safe to try it out because I'm not going to mess anything up. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's great because kids totally get it. Right, right. So since they already get it, you're working with them with their language in their world, that can now become part of the whole toolkit of things that I would do with kids if I want them to be able to goal set. Right, right, right. right. So that would be one way. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I read voraciously. I have a whole shelf, uh, you know, a five foot high bookshelf that just has positive psychology books on it and they're in there too deep for you know, things that are, you know, whatever. Before we called it positive psychology, uh, you know, self-determination and, and self-efficacy and what have you. And, um, and you know, what we have in the new canon of positive psychology books. Um, having access to people who work in the field, so I have, the, you know, I'm on the LinkedIn group for uh, positive psychology coaches and then there's a practitioners group and I'm on Ning for MAP and I have my wonderful MAP friends and since I started in MAP 1 at each new group of people that comes into MAP is that many more people who are in my network of people who do this. Yeah. If I have questions I put it out there to the group. I just had a question recently that I put on Ning. I haven't gotten any response yet so I'll have to maybe try a different um, one of the groups that uh, I am part of and that is I'd like to develop a questionnaire that uses a whole um, collection of questions that are going to map onto student behaviors that can be affected through um, positive psychology interventions. So um, 
Angela Duckworth does this. She's the other person who I just love in positive psychology. Because everything that she does is something I can use. There's like right. nothing in her research that I would look at and say, oh, not relevant. So, you know, some of the economic stuff I would say, you know, relevant in my personal life, probably not relevant in my practice, but everything she does is really terrific. And she was looking at uh, conscientiousness and whether or not there are other ways to measure that. If, um, if you took that out of the ocean uh, five, um, what's conscientiousness made up of because she studies grit? And there was a, a questionnaire. It had lots and lots and lots and lots of questions. And I thought that these questions were fascinating. I was uh, fascinating to me because I'd like to know whether or not you could have someone take a test like that, um, kind of right off the bat, asking them about their behaviors, and it would be a window into exactly where you need to go. Could you make your uh, instead of me doing a lot of things intuitively and kind of looking at kids' materials and asking a lot of questions? There are any of a number of different kinds of things like this that are used in psychological testing and evaluation. You know, the brief, for example, when um, you go for um, you know your neuropsych evaluation or you know ADHD or whatever. But I was I put that out there to my group because I want to know. Yeah. Is yeah. That, how do you make your own validated uh, questionnaire like that? I'm I'm not a researcher. How do you do this? Mm -mm -mm. So that's so I I'm endlessly fascinated. The other thing is that my husband is a high school special ed teacher and he's very interested in positive psychology and he's using uh, this semester for the first time smart strengths also David plays the law of the garbage truck yeah. and he's using these with his classes because he sees kids in a group and he's finding that kids are far more engaged and they make more academic progress mm -hmm. when they're more engaged yeah yeah so I do it at home too right right well, and, and when you learn something new you, you said you, then you integrate it so, so what happens in when you integrate it, what, what does that look like? Uh, different strokes for different folks. I think it depends on what I think somebody needs. So I might integrate something, like I'll try it out the first day that I... So trying know, it out, that's so one I way. So I try it out. That's one way. And then if it kind of falls flat, I might not do anything further with it. I won't forget it. I actually have sitting on my desk a, a little spiral uh, three by five card things. Uh, so I might come up with something that I sort of invent off the top of my head. I'm, I am a creative person, that's one of my top strengths, and I can just keep on inventing all day long. But the ideas we'll do is keep on going past and let us, I write them down. So I've started accumulating them on this little um, three by five card, uh, like it's like a little binder almost. So that's the next thing that I'll do. It, I'll write down what I actually did, and then I'll also make a little note about how it worked or didn't work, and maybe I'll decide that I love it, maybe I'll decide that I don't love it, It'll, maybe it goes nowhere. Maybe it becomes the basis of something that ends up in a book or an article or something. Right, right, right. Um, sometimes I will go back and I will revisit uh, research and, and try and figure out why something didn't work. If I think that there, it has some promise somehow, if I have time for that. Right. Uh, sometimes I will you know, call a friend and say, I did this, I'll, you know, Skyping my friends around the world. I did this and I uh, thought it was great just want to share it with you, or I did this and it didn't work, any ideas why it didn't work. Mostly, I just look at what is working because yeah. I don't have a lot of time to to devote personally and professionally to figuring out what's not working. No. Right. And that would be in keeping with what I want my clients to do also, yeah. is let's yeah. get more of what already works instead of try to figure out what's wrong. Yeah. What, what about, um, what would you say about positive psychology coaching? Do you have, um, is that something special or is that like any other way of coaching or? I, uh, so I'm biased, I'm going to be honest about that. I think that positive psychology coaching is the way to go. If, if you don't have the tools for helping people to move forward beyond just asking them lots of what questions, you, know, you can, uh, coactive coaching, I use that, the, the toolkit in the back of that is really wonderful. Uh, now most of whatever I need that I use on a regular basis that moves me forward with uh, a client, uh, I can kind of do automatically. Um, the things that are not in there are a lot of the things that people who use positive psychology, you know, using the VIA for example, having people know what's good about them. If you believe as a coach that the person you're working with is a whole person and is good and whole and wonderful and that they have within them everything they need to be able to move forward, you must never forget that, that without you, they, those things might stay on the inside and never come out. Yeah. And that is what positive psychology 
um, does is it makes it possible to start identifying all those things that are good about you in many different ways and start um, sort, sort of like putting the uh, it, it's like you're giving somebody a picture like a you know instead of just telling them you know paint by numbers you know what about this oh that goes there what about this oh that goes there instead you're creating something that's much more dynamic and fluid it's like I don't know it's like the difference between something that's very very static a picture of you that you create through coaching and then you just move on and you go do whatever and something that's much more um, vivid and well developed it's it's almost like there's the the art to coaching comes in the form of these other kinds of things that you can learn through positive psychology and I every positive psychology coach I know is also somebody who's done a significant amount of self work yeah. and without that there are lots of people who have decided that they want to help other people and they go into coaching and they take a couple of positive psychology classes or they you know join a positive psychology coaching group it is not the same thing it's kind of like um, you have to understand it at, at the breathing level for yourself and I do think that it's different than any other kind of coaching as a result of that right, right, right. Deb Giffen comes to mind there's somebody who she you can watch her just standing there she inhales whatever it is she exhales whatever it is you know she she lives and breathes and is that positive self and you know there are any number of I could just I could name names of many people like that. Yeah. Um, the, it gives you a, uh, an energy. It gives you uh, a way of taking a step back and not feeling like it's going to whatever you're doing with your your client has to be perfect in the moment because you're strength matching. You know, these are my strengths. These are that person's strengths, and that there are good things about that person that they are just beginning to understand. Yeah. Can, can you say something more about strengths matching? Mm -hmm. So strengths matching um, is what I call me knowing that if I have the strength of um, oh, I don't know, social intelligence plus uh, appreciation of beauty and excellence, I might get someone who comes to see me who does not have very good social intelligence and is uh, is not excellent in some way. Uh, they arrive, they're unattractive, they're, they, um, they're rude, they don't have well-developed social skills. I have to learn how to find something about them that they have that I also um, feel that, that I can use for myself so that we make a connection in some way. Right, right. So it might be that uh, I recognize that person has um, oh. I'm trying to think of a strength. I'm, trying to th I'm thinking of a particular person, and he he struggles on lots of different levels, but he has a strength of humor, and and I can be really funny, so um, that's where we connect. We, I strengths match with him on humor, right, right? Because if I went with my top strengths, my you know right there, uh, and I was going with you know creativity and appreciation of beauty and excellence and. Um, Oh, and yeah, you know, the social intelligence and um, you know the things that come to mind right away when I'm in a one-to-one -one setting with somebody. If I started going with that, um, you know, I have gratitude, so I can. It's easy to be grateful for the littlest things when yeah. your strengths match. Yeah. So if he says something funny, I can be grateful that he's being funny because, whoa, just you know, yeah. it's good. You know, just relaxes everything. We can can relate that way. So that I think is a really important part of being effective in a coaching uh, engagement that you wouldn't have if you didn't know about. Well, right, the, right, the, in right. this case, the VA. Yeah, yeah. Are there things we we have not talked about that are important to understand the rest of what you said, the the way that you work? I don't know. Um, I think that in my case, lots of people do um, coaching with many different kinds of people, but not necessarily in as many different um, domains as I do, because my professional experience is working with kids, families, and teachers. Um, my interest is um, always in making sure that the educational experience for the child is the most important thing, and as a result, you can't have that unless you work with schools. Right. right. I find it that my, my most energizing work is often working with teachers knowing that they think differently about themselves and 
happier teachers have higher achieving students. So that's a way that I would take a research finding and say it is so worth whatever it is it takes to get this into a school because uh, grittier teachers have higher achieving students, happier teachers do. Um, and uh, teacher uh, collective efficacy, that's you know, not just one teacher, but all the teachers feeling like they, they can do it, they can do what needs to get done, that predicts uh, student achievement. So these are things that we need to be taking into schools. That Knowing that that needs to happen really keeps me going. Right, right. Meanwhile, you know, if someone brings me uh, a student or uh, a, a miserable mother who wants to look like Cindy, then I'm all over that because I can make a, a small miracle. But miracles by the hour, I think, are what make it possible for hopefully to get a much bigger miracle to happen in the whole world of education. Right, right, right. So the, the method to my madness is that someday I hope that this is a lot bigger. That's why there's a whole book about it that yeah. takes it into a school setting. Right. And what advice would you give to other people who are kind of new to this and who want to apply some of the research from positive psychology or theories and models and yeah. interventions when they do coaching? I don't even know if I could have advice because I have to say every time I talk to people who are working in positive psychology, they have ideas that are things that I've not come up with yet and I'm a really creative person and they come up with things that haven't occurred to me mostly because we all have different life experience and they have different domain experience and some of the applications that you see that people have in their capstone projects from MAP or even just talking to people who are considering MAP and haven't done it yet really amazing things so I'm not sure I would have advice in that way like you know um, you ought to do such and such instead I think it's figuring out, out what it is that something that you would imagine in your wildest dreams, something you would have thought at one time could never happen. How could you use positive psychology to make that happen one day? And what are you going to do while you're on the road to making that happen? Because it can be really frustrating. You know, If you're the first person in the world, so I'm the first person to, to do positive psychology in my setting, no one knows what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to communicate it to people. And they think you're being, you know, all happy, 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 or whatever, they, they don't get it, and they're, what people know about positive psychology is basically through the media. Yeah. So, you know, I guess a, a request I would make of people, as opposed to advice necessarily, is please share what you're doing by writing about it, by you know, blogging about it, by talking about it, share it with the world so that people know that what it is that we're doing is not fluffy stuff and that it really matters to people. Yeah.